And then lastly, I want to remind everybody, next Sunday is time change. So you don't want to miss out on that. You're going to fall back. And uh, so if you come at, at this time next Sunday, we'll have already started. And uh, you, you may get a lot of the message, and just depending on uh, Pastor Webb, but uh, you'll have missed out on a lot. So you just, just want to go ahead and set your time back next Saturday and be ready for Sunday. Amen. Stand with us this morning. Why don't you turn to someone and just say, I love you. Just tell them, I love you. It'll make them feel good. Just tell somebody, I love you this morning. Amen. Some of you are feeling better already because somebody loves you this morning. Amen. Maybe, husband, tell your wife you love her. If you haven't told her already this morning, tell her you love her. Wife, tell your husband you love him. Amen. What a great opportunity. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning. Come on, why don't you just take a minute and tell the Father you love him. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you for such a great day and moment that we have together in your presence. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place to do what you want to do among us. Lord, we ask that this morning, God, you would receive all the praise, you would receive all the glory, all the honor. Lord, in the midst of our praise, in the midst of our adoration, in the midst of lifting you high, Lord, there's some that walked in this morning with needs that, God, they've been praying a long time that you would meet. God, I pray in the midst of their praise, in the midst of lifting you high, Jesus, would you reach down and bring healing to their body. God, bring healing and restoration, bring peace to their mind. God, restore joy where joy has been taken away. God, help those this morning. God, they've been struggling, needing a job. God, would you provide a job this week for somebody in this place? God, we just ask for miracles to happen this morning. God, we ask for miracles to happen this morning. God, we, we just came to lift you high. We came to lift you up. So, Lord, we do that this morning. We lift you up and we rejoice in your presence. And we give you praise. Come on, give the Lord praise this morning as we worship together. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty grace and treasures of pain would never enough. Oh, but you came Put me back together And yet we desire Is now satisfied
God, that we can trust you. We can trust you with our lives. We can trust you with every situation we face this morning, God, and we trust you. We thank you, God.
out of the grave and when you came out God forgiveness death had been defeated God and there was hope there was healing God there was there was victory in your name God this morning God we want to praise you God we praise you God and then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began morning that sealed the promise your very body oh it began to breathe god there was victory through you Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. We praise you this morning, God. You're worthy. God, you're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. We praise you. We thank you, God, for the work that you've done for us. God, we can never thank you enough. God, the remainder of this service today, God, as your word goes forward, God, may our eyes be focused on, on you, thanking you, God, for what you have done. You're truly worthy to be praised. God, be lifted up. As your word goes forward, God, be lifted up. Every remaining part of this service be lifted up in Sunday school, be lifted up in the second service today. May your name be glorified. How we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today is a new day. It will bring brand new blessings and brand new battles. But within every uncertainty, there is hidden possibility. So I don't dread any challenge that lies ahead because I remember all the victories behind. And my confidence is not in my circumstance. The Spirit of God is my supply. I'm steady under pressure and I'm ready for whatever because whatever comes my way today, the outcome is I overcome. Christ is in me. I am enough. I can handle it. I can't afford to stay afraid or let my faith hesitate. My purpose is at stake. And he who called me is faithful. His strength in me is greater than any pain I feel or enemy I face. The promise of God is mine for the taking. Every plan he has made is guaranteed to come to pass. It will happen. If I don't back down, if I won't let go, it will happen. If I don't stop short, if I won't sell out, it will happen by faith. But faith doesn't take the fear away. It teaches me to fight it. So bring the battle. I'm ready now. I got something for Goliath. I can handle it. My power flows from presence. So I won't stay stuck in what was or worry about what will be. My regrets have been redeemed and my tests have become my lessons. My focus is fixed and my heart is expected. I'm set. I'm not nervous about what's next because my eyes are on the throne. I trust the one who's in complete control, the one who already knows how he's going to work it according to his purpose. Even the worst situations are sure to turn in my favor. If I keep moving forward, keep moving toward him, God is with me in this moment. And whatever happens, I can handle it. I know my help comes from above. So if fear insists on knocking, I'll meet it at the door. Life might give me bad news, but I've still got a good report. I can handle it. If I fall, if I fail, I'll handle it. Grace will give me what it takes to carry on. I can handle it. I have humbled myself under the mighty hand of God. Christ is in me. I am enough. And when the time is right, he'll lift me up. Till then, the lion may roar, but I see his leash. So I keep moving forward, because I've been down before, but my hope knows how to bounce back from rock bottom. What I need, God's got it. Young people, you can head to Children's Church this morning. Brother Jamie, I don't know what it was like on those side of the speakers, but on this side, all the insects are dead in the air. Um, so 
just, I don't know if that was just the monitors or what, but uh, it got into my bones though. All right. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Ephesians. We're going to go to chapter 6 today. Um, for the next few moments, well, all right, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to, I'm going to let you know up front what's happening the next few moments, okay? I, uh, I've got three sermons to preach you this morning. <laughs> and I've already told the worship team to come cut me off about 940, okay? All right, so... That doesn't mean anything. That just means they're going to be on stage with me. All right? Okay. Um, Ephesians, chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians is the book where we uh, learn about how the church is supposed to run, about what the church is supposed to be doing, about who you're supposed to be. He opened up the book of Ephesians, and Paul begins to tell us who we are, who God has made us in his son Jesus. The fact that we are his, his handiwork, his workmanship, the, I, your identity is formed in the first couple of chapters of Ephesians. If you ever need a boost or an encouragement or another, uh, that video we just watched there, if that don't get you ready go to Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and just read who God says you are you need that every once in a while to be reminded but the reason he does that is he's trying to build an, an argument for himself and he builds on the people that you are who you are in Christ and then he moves it into what the church is and then in chapter 4 we see probably the best organizational behavior uh, pamphlet in the whole Word of God. Chapter 4 of Ephesians tells us exactly how the church is to run. And so often, churches that are not doing well, they can't understand why they're not doing well, and it's because they don't read the Bible. They get mad that the preacher's not doing the ministry, and the preacher left the ministry the moment he became the preacher. The preacher is to equip the saints not to do the ministry. The church does the ministry. The pastor is to equip the saints for the ministry. That's what the, that's what the preacher does. That's what the purpose of uh, prophets and apostles and evangelists. And he mentions all that in Ephesians chapter 4. But the truth is, we often get mad at the preacher because he doesn't do enough. But, the truth, the, but if you look at the scripture, the moment the man became the pastor, he left the ministry because his job now is to equip the, the ministers for the work of the gospel in the community. You know, last week, John up here, and he was very wrong. I just want to mention one thing he was very wrong about, okay? Just, just out him. Just teasing. But he came up here and he said, um, y'all work so hard with all the people and you invite them here and then Webb gets an easy, easy harvest but I hope I've done everything I can that they don't get saved in this room they get saved out there and they find a family here I want us all to be a part of the salvation process he it was a joke he was fine with what he said my point is I want to see people getting saved at your jobs I want to see people getting saved in their homes I want to see people getting saved at Leggett's I want to see people getting saved wherever you find yourself during the week I want people to know that you care the presence of God and we're not simply inviting people to church I don't think that's good evangelism come here my preacher is not great evangelism come find Jesus all right thank you pastor Randy <laughs> chapter 5 we start he starts talking about the importance of of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He ends chapter 4 by saying, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. And then he, he follows that up by saying, Therefore, be imitators of God. Do you want to imitate God? Then be kind. There's never room for being rude. Be kind. If you want to imitate God, forgive quickly. Forgive immediately. Forgive quickly. Forgive. If you want to be like God, be tenderhearted, soft to the Spirit. And the first illustration he gives us out of that about being filled is he says, submit to one another. Whoa. Now, this is not what Americans want to hear, right? This is not the scriptures we want to hear. But I'm just telling you right now, the most evident move, the most evident, the most evidence of you being filled with the Holy Spirit is your attitude to submitting to one another. 
You have not fully submitted to God if you do not know how to submit to one another. Because what you are saying is that I cannot trust this other person because I don't fully trust that God's going to take care of me. I can't entrust my, If we fully trusted God, we could entrust ourselves to others because we know that God's going to make up the difference. You say, well, my husband hasn't stepped up in years or whatever. Can God fill that account back up? Then submit. You say she ain't been nice to me in, in weeks. I, what, why in the world do I need to, to care about what she thinks? Do you think God can fill that tank back up? If you don't believe, I, I've had some that they question me about things that are in the church, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not above being questioned. But the, the, answer, the only answer I really have for it is that I know that every word I speak and everything I do, one day I'll have to be accountable for the throne of grace. I'll have to explain what I did or why I did what I did. And I know the, the brevity of that. I know how heavy that is. I know how heavy that is. So we go through, he says submit, and he talks about wives submitting to husbands. That's the husband's favorite verse, isn't it? It's not even addressed to us, but we like that one. No need to keep reading. And then the wife's favorite verse is that you should love like the church. And we say, well, we can't, we can't love like Jesus did. He loved too good. So we're off the hook on that one, but you still got to submit, right? The verse before that said we should mutually submit, and we, we leave that one out. We just skip right to the part that we like. Then he goes on and he talks about masters and he talks about slaves. He talks about children uh, 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 submitting to their parents. And then we get to the whole reason he's writing this book. Is he's trying to build them up personally and then show him how he builds the church. Jesus builds the church, by the way. Jesus is who's building the church. And when the church is done right, that's how Jesus wants to build it. It says he builds them up in love. That's Ephesians chapter 4 through the offices in which he's given the church. And then chapter 5, the best thing we can do is to submit to one another by being filled with the Holy Spirit and trusting that God's going to be able to fill the account back up. And he says all those things to get to chapter 6, verse 10, where he tells us, finally, be strong, stand firm. And that's what I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about. I want to talk to you today because here's what I know. We're in revival here at Askeyville. And if you don't sense it, I really hope you'll start getting in the river with us. Because the power of God is moving. People are beginning to move toward God. Something is stirring in our community, and it's got nothing to do with us. It's got all to do with the Spirit of God. But I want to have as much to do with it as he'll possibly let me. I want to be a vessel that he will use in the midst of it. But what I know is that the more I do for God, the more the devil knows my name, and he's coming after me. And here's every time we have a great moment. Listen, we had... Yeah, those were some conservative numbers, Pastor Kevin said. I'm a, I got some evangelist in me. I think there was over 1,000 people here last night, all right? <clears throat> and half of them got saved, okay? All right, just kidding. <laughs> just teasing. Add that to the ACMR. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Where was I going, Pastor Randy? Help me out. We're in revival. We're doing great things. Last night was awesome. They heard the gospel message over and over again. Every 30 minutes, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Stephanie told every person in that room, whether they were listening or not, it was spoken over them in that moment. Songs were sung over that crowd all night long. They were on the campus full of a bunch of spirit-filled people for, for hours last night. Yeah, they were buzzed with some candy but those people were in an atmosphere where the holy spirit could be taking them to their next step with jesus christ and that's what last night was about we wanted the gospel message to be spoken over them over and over again whether or not there was an altar call or we know what the next step is i wanted it to be clear that the reason we do this event is not to sugar our children but to bless them to move them toward jesus even if it's just a foot that's what we want to do and i'm telling you it's happening 
It's happening. Families are being restored. People are being saved. The gospel is going out. The, the fervor for, God, uh, for the mission, for missions is rising among us. We're a mission-sending church, and even our spirit of missions has been rising around us. We are getting excited. We have to remind ourselves the reason for this building is not because we couldn't handle it in here. It's because we're trying to build something that is going to be for generations forward, for generations in the future. We want to build something that's going to matter to the next generation. We want to show an act of our faith to remind them of how important it is that they keep trusting in God. They put, keep putting their trust in God. We're seeing movement among the, 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 um, the racial divide in our, in our area. Just a couple months ago, y'all, we had like 35 black folks uh, worshiping the Lord with us at night. Now, that may not seem like a whole lot because I don't know what the big deal is, but it was a big deal for them. They've been coached their whole life. You don't come to Askeyville ever, especially at night. And if you don't believe me, we tried to do an event just last year, and we had some. Uh, uh, we were trying to do an event with the seniors, and we had a lady who, who was black. She said, um, I will come do this if you'll do it during the day, but I'm not coming to Askeyville to do a night event for you. And I think that's crazy, but I'm not black. I feel very safe here. We can't change that by simply praying it away. We got to do something about it. We're praying, we're praying that God would break it down, and we're seeing strides there. We're, we're, seeing, we're seeing connections and relationships being built. I'm thrilled about it. I would love in my generation that the stigma of our town would be gone because of the generosity, love, and the willing to do something of the people of this church. God died for all people. The Spirit of God wants to reside in all people. And I want to be a church full of all people. But I'm going to tell you, as we take strides and we keep walking in the direction the Spirit of God has given us, as opportunities come our way and as wonderful things take place, as revival breaks loose and salvations increase, the Spirit of God increases. I want you to also know that there's a target on us. And I'm telling you that today because I feel like sometimes we think revival is going to give us the goosebumps. But goosebumps usually happen in here, and there's a lot of doubt that happens out there. And the reason is... We take a lot of time to get you excited, but we don't take a lot of time to get you ready for out there. If you have a moment with God in this place and you're changed and you, and you know the Holy Spirit is on you, I promise you the devil will make it to your, your ear before the Lord does the next day to remind you this is fake. This, this was just you. It won't real. It's just your emotions. It ain't God. It ain't of God. It, you're going to have all of a sudden all these theological issues with what's taking place, what you're experiencing. And I just want to be very clear with you today that that is not God. God is not trying to confuse you. He's not a God of confusion. He wants to empower you so that you can do something worth doing in this world, which also means that you're going to resist the devil. And this is biblical. How many times, read, when you read the scripture, every time there's something great that takes place, it's immediately followed by a very difficult season. Jesus is baptized. This is my son who I'm very well pleased. This is what really hit me with that recently. He hadn't even done anything yet. He was just born. He ain't earned nothing. And God splits the heavens up and says, I'm proud of this kid. What had Jesus done worth being proud? He ain't healed nobody. He ain't changed nothing like no water into wine or anything like that. He hadn't done anything at this point. And so God looks down at his son and he says, you never earn for me. I love you because you're my boy. Now, you know, he says that to us too, right? You can't earn your way. In fact, I want you to know that God is really, really against you trying to earn anything with him. He doesn't mind your effort. He loves your effort. But he can't stand our earning. When we think, I did this for you, he want to be like, oh, we want to talk about what we did for each other. Okay, all right. Let's get your list out and I'll get my list out. You don't, you're not worthy of being a son or daughter 
by worth, you are worthy of being a son and daughter by birth. There's no earning. You can't make yourself holy enough to make him impressed. Oh, wow, look at that kid. Doesn't happen. As good things take place, we need to be on guard. That the next step will be probably a test or an attack of some sort, spiritually. And I've seen too many people, they'll step out in faith, powerful moments. I'll see them step out in faith, and literally within a few weeks, their marriage or their job or something will crumble, and they will lose everything. And they lost more than they ever gained in the Spirit. I've watched people get, get on fire. I've seen them pray over missions or pray, uh, or pray some strong prayer over this congregation or this community. I've seen them get on fire for God. And the moment something happens wrong in their life, they begin to recluse themselves and they are gone. They're, to- they're toast. The gift is put out. And it breaks my heart. And so what I, the reason I'm telling you that today is not to say, well, get ready, the devil's coming after you. The reason I'm telling you that is that I want to tell you that you can endure all the, the, the aims of the devil. You can endure all the darts of the devil. Because sometimes we think to ourselves, if I can just get to the altar, everything will be well. If I could just get to the altar, I'd finally get saved or I'd finally, my marriage would finally get healed. And I just want you to know that if it's your marriage that you're worried about, the devil knows that. And the first thing he's going to attack if you get to this altar is your marriage. And what you've got to learn how to do is not give up in the middle of the fight. Don't give up. Keep, keep pushing forward. So let me read some scripture. Come on. All right. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen, why in the world? This is spiritual language. Why can't he just say, I'm going to pray over you and you won't have to worry about any evil schemes? Why can't he do that? Do y'all remember the scripture? Jesus is talking to Peter, and he says, the devil has asked to sift you out. Y'all remember that verse? Y'all remember what he follows that up with? But I have prayed that you... Well, don't pray. You're Jesus. Beat the devil up. Tell him he can't have me. Tell him no. Back off. You're protecting your kid. Put a hedge of protection around me. That's what I want. I don't want weapons. I want protection. I want you to decimate the enemy. I want you to preemptive strike them. Now, when I want that, I have to remind myself there was a time that I was on that team too. And I'm so glad he didn't preempt every strike with every person. He gave me an opportunity of grace. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil is scheming against you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What's going to happen in this season is you're going to have more conflict with people that you're, you're not even going to understand. It's going to be believers. You're going to have some conflict with believers, and you're going to be shocked that they could be mad or mean, or they're going to say these things against you, or they're going to say these things to you. You are going to be confused. There are going to be moments that you, even me, I'm going to preach in this pulpit, and there are going to be moments that you're going to sit back and go, well, oh, that's not truth. I don't know about that, okay? Now, now listen. If I'm actually not speaking truth, please confront me. I'm not asking you to just take it on the chin. And what I'm saying to you is the devil is working in our minds. And if he can get us to misunderstand one another, that's going to be his favorite trick. The more misunderstanding we we have of one another, the more frustrated we're going to be with one another. And the easier it's going to be to not be around one another. Every time I get around that, I just get irritated. It might just be... That the devil is trying to keep you from a brother or sister that you need to be with. In our culture today, we say a whole lot of stuff about boundaries and, and I, don't, I don't need to be around that kind of person. I don't need to be around that negativity. Um, but negative folks need people. 
How are they going to find the light? How are they going to find Christ if, they, if you never present it to them or are willing to be around them? The schemes of the devil are trying to do everything he can to rip us away from what God wants us to be a part of. So let us be careful. Let us be mindful. Let us be watchful over our lives. Let us take time to sense and hear what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. The next time you get angry, bent out of shape, Ang- uh, ready to kill somebody, ready to let somebody have it, ready to blast somebody. The next time you get torn out of the frame like that, why don't you just take a second and sit down before you say something you regret and search your feelings. Where's this coming from? Am I really mad at this person? And sometimes the answer is, a yeah. But it would all do us well to be slow to anger. Take a second and ask, is this really what I'm angry about? Because I'm telling you, as we continue to see the power of God move, we are fortunate people. We are seeing the presence of God move among us. The more fortunate we become to see that stuff, the more we're going to see the demonic realm as well. And I wish, look, I've been on mission trips where I've seen real demonic stuff, real demonic activity show up. I remember praying in the altar one time, and uh, there was a minister that went to go pray for a lady, and as his hand went toward her, her back bent away from him until her back was compl- like her her back was like completely further than a 90 degree angle away from his hand as he was trying to pray for her because there was a demon in her and finally she released and that demon came out and she snapped back into place and there was deliverance i'm telling you i've seen demonic activity i remember one time i was in mexico and i mean uh, i think it was mexico it was either mexico or peru but i was in a in a rehab center and i was praying i was leading worship up there didn't speak any spanish so i was singing in english and we were in, and i looked in the back of the room and there was about three guys having a conversation with three heads beside them they were all having conversations with their own personal demons and they were casting things at me i kept seeing they were starting to foam from the mouth and they were throwing they were casting things i mean i was freaking out i lost it scared me to death when they told us it was time to go i snatched the 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 uh, i was playing a keyboard i snatched the the thing out of the wall and i grabbed the keyboard and ran right to the to the van when i got there i was trembling all over i said i need y'all to pray for me i need y'all to pray for me. I'm, 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 I'm losing my mind you don't know what i just saw i saw those the I saw faces. They were there was a there was there was no body, but there was faces there, and they were casting things at me. I don't know what they put on me. I was losing it. And the missionary I was with, he said, uh, "Webb, get in the van. We got to go. We're, we're late." And I said, "You don't understand me. I am freaking out. I don't know what they put on me, but I'm scared." He said, Be- "Webb, better is he, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world." And get in the van. We got to go. And the moment he spoke that scripture, every bit of my fear went away. And I got to tell you, I ain't been afraid of a circumstance like that again. Sometimes we forget the power we have within us. One time I was in Peru. And there was some witch doctors. We were doing a, we were, we were in a park and we were playing some worship. And there was some witch doctors, literally witch doctors. I, I know that sounds like. Anyway, uh, witch doctors, they were were over there. And so the missionary went over to go talk to them or whatever. And the missionary was speaking to them. And and, uh, he said, uh, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, we're just two doctors. We're two witches. And we like to look and and we like to, we have the ability to see where people's spiritual um, power is. We can see their spiritual power. And he's like, oh, really? He said, yeah. And he's like, so tell me. And he started pointing out different people. That person, they've got no spiritual power. I'm not scared of them. In fact, they're so, they're, their power is so weak and so small. I, um, we could go and manipulate them, and we could scare them to death in no time. And he's like, really? Wow, that's crazy. So he starts pointing out different people. He said, I can see that person's spiritual power. There ain't much there. He said, that person right there is a pretty strong person. And he, he pointed up to where the worship team was. He said, how about all the guys under the... the um, the gazebo they're leading worship and they looked at each other and got real wide-eyed and they he said uh well we don't want to talk about that and he said well tell us no what he said all everyone on that worship team we can't even see the top of where their power is like that they, they are they are the most powerful people we've ever seen and he goes well doesn't that scare you 
And he said, no, no, because they have no idea what they have. Christians don't scare us because they don't even walk in the confidence they got. If we're just as quick to fear as everyone around us, do we really have any faith? If we are quick to come completely undone every time the devil has a scheme against us, are we really in being empowered by the Holy Spirit? Now, this isn't, to, this isn't meant to, to hurt you or anything. This is meant to be convicting. Don't take for granted the power that you've been given. Jesus came from heaven above so that you could be empowered to to push back. The devil's got nothing on you. There's nothing the devil can do to you because of the power within you. You can endure and overcome everything the devil comes at you with. So how do we do it? How do we put on the armor of God? He says, put on the whole armor of God. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand, therefore. Well, first thing I want to tell you is stand. Take a stand and don't quit. If you're believing for your children, don't pray reluctant prayers. Lord, if you want to. No, no, you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I want this. I believe it's your will. I'm praying it's your will, but I I believe it's your will. You said it was your will that none should perish, and I'm hanging on to that. I'm not letting go. I'm going to believe that their mind's going to come back to you, that their heart's going to come back to you. I'm not done. I'm going to come back to this altar over and over again. You come to this altar, and you go back home, and you think God's magically fixed your marriage, and guess what? That person's going to be more nitpicky over your mac and cheese than it's ever been. They're going to hate everything you cook, and you're going to say, well, what was that, Lord? What are you doing? And he's like, oh, I thought you came up here for power. No, I came up here for you to fix it. Okay, but see, I'm in the power industry. That's what I do. I give you power to endure. I've overcome the world. You're going to have trials. He promises that. What did he say, though? He said, I'll be with you. Come on, I don't want you to be with me. I want you to fix it. You wait in Jerusalem till you be endued with power, power to be my witnesses. Witnesses of what? Can I just tell you that if you don't endure difficulties, you ain't witnessing anything? If the only thing you witness is how easy your life is, nobody's going to be changed by that. But if you can commit and talk about the fact that God has helped you endure through trial and difficulty and cancer and divorce and heartbreak and and brokenness and, and death, if you can be able to speak about those things and keep picking up every single day and walking forward, that's what it means to be a witness. It doesn't mean to be a witness that you can say a lot of scripture, that you can preach a lot of words, that you've had an easy life. It doesn't speak anything. He gives us the power to be witness. Witnesses and witnesses are people who've endured some mess. Paul has the authority to speak to us the way he does because his body is riddled with scars. No one is more hated. No one has been spoken against more than Paul. And so I'm not asking you to shrink back. Please hear me. The choice is you can either get into the Lord but also be a target of the devil or you can quit this whole thing and have a relatively simpler life and mean nothing in this world. You've been given one life. Let's do something. Understanding that every step we take in the spirit is another moment where the devil sees us. And comes after us. So he says, be fit. He says, uh, put on the armor of God. This is what he wants you to do. Take up the whole armor that you may be able to withstand. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth is, now this is very important because I want us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I do. There's nothing more important than us being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But we cannot check our brains in at the door. And think that just our emotional or even our spiritual state is going to overcome what the truth is. We need truth. The truth is actually what binds everything together. The belt of truth is what puts it all together. 
So we're not asking anybody to come in here and just check your brain in at the door and, and just feel something. What I'm telling you today is in order for it all to fit together, you need the truth. And the truth is in the word of God. It is also in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit who tells you. So here we go. Fasten the belt of truth. The second thing, put on the breastplate of righteousness. I want you to understand that your vital organs are what, what the breastplate ser- saves. Your heart, your, your, in- your innards, your lungs, all of that is protected by what? Now, he could have used anything to represent the breastplate, but he said by the righteousness, righteousness of God. Can I tell you that when everybody else is talking about your reputation is being destroyed, the thing that will keep people from undermining your heart is when they look at you and say, yeah, I don't believe that about them. And I just want you to know, you cannot produce righteousness of your own. You can look like you're righteous, but you cannot produce righteousness of your own. It is what God does in you. It is the righteousness of God. It is the glory of God for you to have any type of actual righteousness. And what Peter tells us, I think it's in Second Peter, he says, when the Gentiles speak against you and ruin your reputation, there will be some that will say, no, no, I know them. And your character will speak louder than the reputation they're trying to destroy. And they'll call out to your God because they see how you endured it. The breastplate of righteousness is what protects all your vital organs, and we need it. We need righteousness. We need holiness. We need a people that are willing to say no to every enjoyment of this world and be able to say yes to the simplicity and solitude, the silence, to the places of God that matter more. That would say, that would say no to every vacation and say yes to every time alone with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying every vacation. Let me be clear. Don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Have your vacations. I'm saying to you, don't neglect the time with God. Please. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. That means everywhere we walk, we should be bringing peace and good news. So let me tell you today, believer, if, you, if your shoes walking into a room, everybody knows that we're getting ready to talk about gas prices and Joe Biden. You have not shod your feet with the gospel of peace. If you walk into a room and people immediately roll their eyes because they know that negative Nancy walked in the room. Hope no Nancys are in the room. (laughs) You need to be careful about who you are. If you bring stress and anxiety to everybody, unless it's to their demons, you know. There's some people that don't like that either. If you come in talking good news, there's going to be some people that roll their eyes at you. And that's the kind of eye roll I want. I want people to be upset about me because I won't stop talking about Jesus. If they're going to be upset about something, I hope it's that and not all my problems. The crazy thing about my problems is they're mine. Why do I keep sharing them? Nobody else is going to help me, and they certainly don't want to hear about it. I ain't helping nobody. Every place your feet go, you should be bringing good news, the gospel, and peace. Then he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. The, only, the protection that you have. Now, remember, we're talking about Roman gladiators, I mean, uh, Roman uh, centurions. So that shield was huge. It wasn't a little teeny baby shield. It was a huge shield. In fact, it was used. The Roman armies were really good at protecting their brother because of how big the shield was. They were a defensive army. They would lock those shields, and they would come upon you little by little by little, and then they would get close to you. they stab over the shield, and they'd go a little further. they stab over the shield. That's why they were so hard to beat because of the shield. It wasn't because of their swords. It wasn't because of their spears. It wasn't because of their horses. It wasn't because of their cavalry. It was because of the shield. The shield is the most powerful thing you got, and that's your faith. The next time the devil comes at you and begins to whisper, it's over. Why don't you speak some faith? Why don't you say, no, that's not it, and you push him back a little bit. No, 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 no. You're not going to come at me like that. No, 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 no. I'm going forward. I'm not going back. I'm standing firm. I'm going to push you forward, and then I'm going to be standing firm right here again, and I'm not taking you're not taking my family you're not taking my house you're not taking my peace you're not taking my joy i'm going to push you back devil a little bit further and i'm going to take a step but i'm going to stand firm right here and then this is what i got we're not supposed to be retreaters by the way we don't have any armor on our backside 
You turn and run, that's on you. He only protects the front. Now, A, because God's got our back, okay? All right? But it's really hard to have our back when we turn and run, isn't it? He says, hold the line. And we're like, you hold the line. I'll see you later. The shield of faith is powerful. It's the way we move forward. Now, I'm not talking about kooky stuff where we're just dreaming up random things. I'm talking about you need to speak faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. When you hear the word of God, you stand on the promises of this word and you keep pushing it back. Just like Jesus did. Remember, the devil knows the scripture too. He comes to tempt Jesus and the first he starts quoting scripture at Jesus. I do that too sometimes. I start quoting scripture at Jesus like he forgot. You said in your word, I know what I said. <laughs> well, I'm standing on it. And then he gives us the one offensive, the one offensive uh, thing we have is the sword of the spirit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I jumped one. Uh, the shield of faith, which will help to sing, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. The thing that your thoughts, listen, I'm going to take too long on this and it's, yeah, we're, yeah, well, this is what I needed to say to you today. I know, I know I, I was wrestling between these three thoughts and I've said two of them, by the way. Okay. There's only one left, but your thoughts for too long, too many people wrestle with the wondering of whether or not they are saved. And every time they meet difficulty, they immediately start to wonder, wow, am I going through this difficulty because I'm not saved or I'm not doing what God called me to do? Is the reason I'm finding this frustration is because God doesn't want me to do it. I'm almost going to, I'm going to tell you right now, the devil, the devil, the devil does not resist things outside the will of God. Can you hear that? When difficulties come your way, that is not a marker that God is trying to get your attention. It is a marker that you've gotten the devil's attention. Never quit in a battle, ever. If you've entered a battle, you fight to the death, and then you can think about it. Never quit a job when you're angry, ever. Never quit a marriage when you're angry, ever. Don't quit when it's tough. That's what the devil wants you to do. That's why he's made it tough. Too often we'll enter a difficulty like that and we'll start asking stupid, uh, not stupid, I'm sorry, questions. Like, am I saved? Am I really saved? If I miss that, how, am I really saved? Did God really love me? If I, if I miss that, am I really saved? I had a conversation with a dear friend of mine this week. Uh, he comes from a Baptist background. I came from this church. And uh, he, one of the things that we love to talk about every time for some reason, we love to talk about eternal security. And so he grew up in eternal security. And always he's telling me that one of the issues he has with our background is, is I, I grew up in eternal insecurity. I got saved every week. I was scared to death. I called my grandmom at 3 o'clock in the morning because I didn't trust my parents would have actually gone up in the rapture, but I knew she would have. <laughs> and I don't believe in no age of accountability mess either. That ain't biblical. I don't believe in it. I was scared. Seven years old, I was scared to death that God was trying his best to leave me behind. And that ain't good. I actually had a parent a few weeks ago. They said to me, my kids don't live nearly under the fear and trepidation. I must be doing something wrong. And I was like, maybe we're actually confident in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Maybe we're teaching our children to be confident in their salvation of Jesus Christ. And they're not afraid of everything because they have actually been taught about the goodness of God and not just the judgment. Now, judgment's real. So... 
we had this conversation, but in the conversation, he said to me, I remember as a kid, though, that I, every Sunday I would go up to the altar because I didn't, want, I didn't know if I was still saved. And he said, for three or four weeks, I went to the altar, and finally the preacher met me at the altar, and he said, son, you've been here three weeks in a row. You, you've got to stop. And he said, but I don't know. And he said, did you pray it? Yeah. Did you believe it? Yeah. Are you living it? Yeah. That's it. And that comforted him enough that he never went and asked for salvation again. Now, he's a man of God. I know the salvation took, okay? He's re- it's real. I didn't get to that level of confidence till I was in my 20s. Now, what I'm telling you today is if the devil can keep us wrestling about our salvation, we're never going to take any room. We're never going to take any ground on, on, on the battlefield. If every time we get our feelings hurt, we begin to think that God's not with me or he doesn't love me or he's not taking care of me or what have I done to tick him off or what have I... Well, if we're shrinking back every time something difficult takes place, we're never going to take advance at all on the field. So I'm telling you today, those who believe and receive, I'm sorry, those who believe receive and are called the sons and daughters of God. John chapter 1 verse 12, you don't need to question it anymore. If you believe... Receive the salvation of Jesus Christ today and walk in confidence in the direction. That's what protects your mind. Every time you think to yourself, I'm not good enough, I've not been far enough, I've not gone far enough, what protects your thoughts in your mind is reminding yourself, no, I am a child of God, I am his son, I am his daughter, I'm moving forward, he's not left me behind, I'm not the tail, he is going to move me to the front, I am blessed, I am strong, and I'm not trying to turn into Joel Osteen here, but I'm just telling you right now, I promise you, if you can settle the fact that you have been saved and your job now is to enter into the battle and go as far as he'll possibly empower you to go that's where the devil doesn't want you to be is in in the battle so if he can keep you on the sidelines wondering am i saved is it really taking this time is it really am i or even worse if he's constantly getting you thinking about everybody else's salvation that's another thing that he loves to get us to think go go on the sidelines and start contemplating are the people really discipled around you Hmm, are they do they really listen to the Holy Spirit? Let me just tell you, when you get to heaven, you've got one piece of paper, one, one person that you've got to answer for, you. So stop worrying about everybody else. I, that's, that's my least favorite um, conversation to have. Some people come to me and they say, I've got an issue with you, I'm just concerned. I'm fine because I know the word, but I'm afraid about everybody else. But don't do that. Because God is not going to ask you one thing about anybody else. Now, guess what? He's going to ask me about y'all, and I take that very seriously. But if you're sitting around thinking that nobody else is going to know anything, you might have some pride. Not thus saith the Lord. Just saying, might. All right, let me move on. Last one, sword of the Spirit. We see in Hebrews that it's the Word of God. It's the double-edged sword. It encourages and edifies. I mean, sorry, it encourages and it convicts the sword of the Spirit. It's also the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's also the Word of God. We fight our enemy. Our enemy, again, reminded, not flesh and blood. No humans are your enemy. I don't care how mean they are to you. They ain't your enemy. It's the principalities behind those words that are doing everything they can to break you down. And so that's why we don't need to be mad at people who are mean or dumb. We need to reject the words that ain't true and move on. We pull the sword of the Spirit out and we remind ourselves. You know, I tell my son this. I've been getting on my nerves a lot lately. I mean, this thing, not my son. My eight-year-old son, he's as clever as his dad, and I've always been somebody that will snap back real quick because I, I think I'm smart. So the other day, he was telling me some crazy thing about, um, I don't know, he just always brings up some crazy thing. And I, I laughed, trying to be a good, like, granddaddy figure in his laugh when I'm laughing at his really dumb jokes, right? <laughs> and I said, boy, you're so dumb, because that's what I grew up with. When you, when, when you admonish somebody, it has to be negative, right? You can never encourage somebody by saying you're clever. You have to say you're stupid or you're dumb or 
But that's how, I remember my papa, boy, he would, that was how he, he would get this laugh going on, and he said, boy, what ails you? Common denominator, something ails me. Because I made him laugh, something's wrong with me. So anyway, I said to my son, boy, you're so dumb. And before I could get the B on the end of the dumb out, he said, your face. Now, I'm trying not to get offended, right? <laughs> Slow to anger is what I'm working on. Do you, know, do you know what helped me move through that moment? Not yell at him, not get mad, and not even, like, press on him? Because, I mean, on, on one hand, it could be seen as disrespect. I know he was just being playful and fun, okay? But do you know what helped? I've seen this face. And so what my eight-year-old little son says about my face don't hurt me at all because I know what my face looks like. Come on, somebody. <laughs> a few years ago, I had a friend on Facebook. He was posting this this crazy stuff he's a he's a uh, very leftist guy and I think it was during Black Lives Matter stuff and I I just posted up there shouldn't have should have known better but I posted up there just a differing opinion should have known better and I got blown out of the water by half of the people I went to school with they called me ignorant they said I I don't I haven't read a book my whole life I'm a country bumpkin from nowhere they said the only thing I've studied in my life was a donut. They put that on Facebook. <laughs> Y'all are laughing at that. Let me just tell you, in the heat of battle, that didn't feel like a funny joke. That they, that they would surmise my entire existence to being chubby because I disagreed with them on a political idea? What? Amanda did not take too kindly to it. So that was my last comment, but it won't her last one. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm telling you all that. I had to get to a point where I, I could be offended that somebody would say that, but let me just tell you, I didn't go on Facebook to receive my identity. I go to the Word of God. And if for those who believe and receive are called the children of God, then I don't care what you call me. You can say I'm ignorant. You can say I'm from nowhere. You can say all I've done is ever studied a donut. At that particular time, I had been on a journey where I'd lost about 100 pounds, but they didn't care. <laughs> if you let the critics on the sidelines tell you how to run the play in the game, you're never going to get anywhere. You ever watch the football games now? The quarterback is out there. He's calling all the plays. And in between every play, if you ever get a second, he, he's doing this number here. And then you come back to the huddle. Good land, y'all. <laughs> that wasn't even in my notes. My goodness. The next time you have a play, I don't care how many yards you've lost, I think you need to take a step back and listen to what the coach is saying. They got speakers in their ears. I don't know if you know that, okay? But anyway, they go back, they listen to what the, what the coach is saying, and then they come back and they call the play, and then they go and they run the play. They don't listen to what they're yelling from the stands. They don't listen to the ref. They don't listen to the commentator. They have to shut all that out. They cover their ears so they can hear just their coach. They go back behind the line, and they listen to what the coach says. The coach calls the play. The coach calls the play. Not me. I got to go back and hear what the coach says. And then I'm going to come back with confidence and I'm going to run whatever he says. Now, if you'll do that enough, you'll also be strong enough to call an audible every once in a while when the Spirit says so. You'll get there and you'll start noticing, oh my gosh, I've seen that before. 
Hey, y'all, this is good. I should have done the whole sermon on this. You get up to that line and you'll start reading it. Oh, I've seen the devil do that before. Oh, oh, I've seen people talk to me like that before. Oh, I, that ain't new. Hey, hey, we're going to change this one. We're going to change this one, all right? I know exactly what they've got for me. All right, go to shotgun. Let's go. And you'll start picking out what the devil's trying to do to you if you'll pay attention to what's happening in your life. Every time you take a step in Christ, he's, the devil's going to come after you like a, like a strong. And the thing is, if you, if, you, if you pay attention, you'll know exactly how to fight back every single time. And I'll tell you where to start. Being filled with the Holy Spirit and knowing the Word of God, that's how you start. Be filled with the Holy Spirit today. That's how you're going to be empowered to do it. And know the play. That's, that's the Word of the Lord. If you don't know what to say back to the devil, if you don't know how to handle it, I'm just telling you, you're, you, you, you're toast. You're toast. So one of the things I wanted you to know today is tomorrow is October 31st. And most of the world celebrates Halloween. And I don't. You're going to see my obligatory post tomorrow about Happy Reformation Day. October the 31st, 1517, a man by the name of Martin Luther had some concerns about the church. He wrote 95 concerns down and posted it on the front of his church. It caused such a ruckus, he got excommunicated from the Catholic Church over it, began to start a movement called the Protestant Reformation. By the way, we're still reforming by protesting over each other again. Since this has taken place, we've splintered into 5,000 different kind of denominations. Did y'all hear the ones he talked about last week? The Pentecostal free will Baptist? I mean, how many types of Baptists can you have, you know? Some people have gotten real smart. They just say non-denominational. Here we go. Reformation Sunday. That's today, but tomorrow is the day of Reformation. 505 years ago, he nailed that to the door to say to the church. The church was corrupt in, in hundreds of ways, from the Pope all the way down to those who served in the altar. The Pope was corrupt and taking money, all that, he, all that he could get. They were selling indulgences. They said, if you bring this much money, I can save you and even your dead family. I can send them to heaven if you'll put this much money in the coffer. Now listen, if some of y'all don't pay your tithes, I'm going to have to resort to that, okay? It's a joke. LOL. All right, LOL. I will never do that. Okay, LOL. The Pope was telling people that you could purchase your salvation, that if you came to the church and did the sacraments, taking communion and stuff like that, that's how you earn your way to God. Martin Luther read the scripture and realized that that is not the truth. And so he just wanted to bring the church to, into reformation. What he ended up doing is causing a whole new movement that we're a part of. Thank God. But these are the five things he believed. Number one, we're people of the scripture only. We follow the scripture alone. 1 Timothy 3.16 says that the, the Scripture is God-breathed. It was breathed out by the Holy Spirit. So we believe in Scripture alone. The second thing is that our salvation is through Jesus alone. Can I get an amen? You cannot receive salvation any other way. Your works will never do it. These are foundational principles that the next time the devil wants to come against you, I would encourage you to go back to these ideas. The next time he says you haven't done enough or you've messed up too much, you say, uh-uh, Jesus alone, my friend. Jesus' blood alone. And we receive it through faith alone. Through faith alone. Nothing you can do could ever make him love you more or less. We receive it through faith alone, not works. And it's through the grace of God that he gives it to us. It's by the grace of God that He gives it to us. Let me just tell you, God is a generous God. He loves you. He is good, and He wants to do miraculous, beautiful things for you. He wants to give you favor in your life. And so we believe because of the Scripture alone, that Jesus alone is our salvation, that we receive through faith, by grace, for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Because listen here. There's a lot of things God can do, but if he can save one of a wretch like me, what in the world could give him more glory than that? 
The whole earth was built for his glory. And yet I'm the only thing that was selfish enough to receive, to look after my own. So if he can redeem my heart, I can turn it back to him. He receives ultimate glory. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is foundational principles that you can remind yourself. Be reminded over and over again. No, no, no. I'm going back to the scripture because my salvation is found. The the word of God, Jesus, who became flesh, the word of God became flesh so that I could could follow him. And through him, I received salvation through faith alone, by grace alone, for God's glory alone. God, I pray today that we would be reminded of this foundational understanding that through your word that is the that is what we fight against the enemy with that's what how we learn who we are that's where we find our identity we find our identity we fight the enemy remind us again open our eyes again Jesus we have to come to you Lord I pray that through your word and through your spirit, Lord, we would be filled today. We would be filled today with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would be filled today by your Holy Spirit. Lord, according to your word, we would recognize that your spirit is offered to us, that we can be empowered to be your witnesses in this world. Help us to know who we are in you and help us to push back the devil every time he comes against us. Help us to find our identity in you and help us to fight against the the fiery darts of the devil every time he pushes against us. Lord, let us be people who who run after you with all of our heart to be filled, but also let us be people who, who are watchful for what the enemy is trying to conspire against us. Let us be people who know the word of the Lord, that when people are looking and asking about where Jesus is and how they can find salvation, we can answer it, but we can also be people that when those same people come against and they try to ruin our reputation, we can say to the devil, you don't get to say to me who I am. Jesus says to me who I am. So church, let's just stand right now. Let's just ask the Lord to fill us. Be filled today, church. Be filled. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. Open your arms up to the Lord and just, just receive today. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let's receive Him afresh and anew today. Let us take on this warning. Let us receive it again. Let's sing, I need thee to him. I need thee, Holy Spirit. We need you. I need thee, oh, I need thee. but I believe when you lay hands on one another that the Lord wants to the Lord can activate power through one another he says when you have issues come to the elders of the church let them lay hands on you and pray so today if you want special prayer I want to pray for you come on would you, would you, would you come today maybe you just want to take a step of faith and you want to just say I just need extra power Lord I want to go where you want me to go because I need you alright let's sing it again I need thee
to dynamite. Preachers love talking about dunamis. That's, that's the Greek word, dunamis. It means dynamite. The only problem with that was dynamite was created in like the 1800s. And so when Luke is writing this, he don't know what dynamite is, okay? When Luke is writing it, he is talking about power. But he's talking about pi power with dynamic. That's the word. It actually means dynamic power. And when we think dynamic, again, we want to say dynamite, but it actually means multifaceted power. That God gives you the power to speak up, and he also gives you the power to shut up. He gives you the power to endure for a long time, but he also gives you the power to overcome. He gives you the power to listen and he gives you the power to speak. He gives you the power to wait and he gives you the power to go. He gives you the power to heal and he gives you power to endure without healing. So what we're not saying to God is, Lord, I need your power so I can do this. We say, God, I want your power so I can do what you tell me to do. And I promise you, he'll give you whatever you need for the length of time that you need it, right when you need it for as long as you need it. But we gotta trust God to get there. God, thank you for the power that you've given each one of us. I pray that we would demonstrate it powerfully for a lost world. Let us be grounded on this word. Let us push back the fight of the devil. Let us be filled today. And let us be ready with all of our being for whatever comes our way. Help us, God. Help us to be what you want us to be. We love you. We praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you today. Put on the full armor of God this week. Let's push back the devil. God bless you. See you in Sunday school.